So welcome everybody, good evening. Um, welcome to the Protestant Academy in Lokum. Also you are, um, or we are all only virtual today. And so uh, my name is Thomas Müller-Farber and I'm the program director for international affairs here at the Academy. And last week we had um, a larger hybrid conference in Lokum um, on the Gulf region. And today, so to speak, the concluding round on, on this event. Um, and our today's um, topic or, or leading question is um, Europe engulfed in the Gulf. How shall Europe, uh, Europe's future engagement with the region in turmoil look like? And actually, I, uh, frankly, when I, when I crafted this uh, program a couple of months ago, I had the feeling that that question might be a bit too pessimistic. But uh, with the likelihood of growing escalation in the Gulf region, in particular since last week, um, it uh, rather looks like that it's, it's very um, in line with the current um, developments. And um, people who know me um, um, are wonder, might wonder why I'm so excited. And um, well, that's because of that marvelous panel we, we brought together for, for tonight. Um, each speaker are I think a great asset to the discussion. And um, I would like to introduce to you, um, first of all, at least in my screen, I see it on the lower, lower left, it is Hanna Neumann. She is at the European Parliament and she is there with the Greens. And she has a strong background in peace and security research. And consequently, she is at the, foreign, at the um, European Parliament, member of the Committee for Foreign Affairs and also with the subcommittee sub on security and defense. And she's also vice chair of the subcommittee on human rights. And apart from that, she's also very knowledgeable about the region because she um, is also chair of the European Parliament's delegation for the relations with the Arab Peninsula. And some people told me um, that you are also somehow the rising star in at the, Green, at, at the Greens for when it comes to uh, foreign and security policy. So we are glad that you're here. Thanks for coming, uh, Hannah Neumann. And then at the very uh, lower bottom of the, the screen, you see Dorothy Schmidt. We reach her today in Paris. And she is there, the head of the Turkey and Middle East program at IFRI, that is the French Institute uh, of International Relations. So the leading French think tank uh, in the field of foreign affairs. And um, in her function, she, of course, um, carried out a number of consulting missions for public institutions like the European Commission or the French Foreign, um, Foreign Ministry. And of course, she published extensively on the region. And um, we are very thankful that you're here because I personally think it's crucial to have uh, a French voice in each and every um, 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 foreign policy um, topic. And I think in the region, it's also very crucial to have you on board. So thanks for coming, Dorothy Schmidt. And then we have um, at the left higher, higher um, part of the screen, Niels Annen. He's Minister of State at the German Foreign Office. And he's in that function also, because that brings the function, um, member of the um, parliament, parliament, the German Bundestag for the Social Democrats. Um, I would say Mr. Anne is one of the most knowledgeable decision makers in Germany when it comes to foreign policy. He invested considerable time and effort already in the field when he was full-time parliamentarian. And since I know he's, it's a busy time in real world diplomacy, um, in particular in the Gulf region, we are in particular thank you, thankful that you are here this evening with us. And then last but not least, um, we have um, Cornelius Adeba. He is an Iran, Iran expert, uh, written a couple of books about it um, and a couple of papers also very recently. He is um, with the Carnegie Europe Center and he also has also strong links with the Deutsche Gesellschaft für Auswärtige Politik and the Herdy School. And he is in particular interested in Europe's role in the region. And that makes him somehow a perfect fit for the discussion. And he's also the link between um, our concluding panel and the broader conference we had last week, because there he had an active moderating part as well. So thank you, Cornelius Adebar, for joining in. 
And welcome also to all participants out there um, who we cannot see. Um, we will now proceed like uh, following. We will have first of all a moderated uh, talk and afterwards um, a QA. and a um, And you can join in the Q&A um, posing questions um, by using the, the chat function so everyone can see your, your comments and your question or the Q&A function. So you have both choices. And with that, I would say I would like to start right away um, and hopefully more participants will come because we have registered more than 130 people. So um, we're confident that more people will tune in soon. Um, I would like to start the moderation, moderating, moderated um, panel discussion now. And um, before we move to the more general question that has the title also of the panel, I would first of all do a brief kick off, up, uh, kick off round. Um, looking more to the um, recent development we saw um, during the last week or this week um, when it comes to the escalating part. So we had we started this year, um, January, um, with the killing of um, an Iranian um, general, Soleimani. And it seems somehow this, that this year 2000, apart from other craziness, will also end with the killing of another prominent figure um, in the Iranian security apparatus, the atomic scientist, the so-called father of the Iranian nuclear program. And maybe it's just me, but um, many people as well, I have, I guess, the feeling that this could lead to an escalatory scenario. And I would first do this kick off round asking you, Hannah Neumann and Nils Annen afterwards, how do you see the danger of escalation in the Gulf? Um, how how severe, how high is the danger of escalation? So please, maybe Hannah Neumann, you, you, you go first. Thanks, Thomas, for the question and also for bringing in this very actual information that you may not have had when you conceptualized this panel. Um, let me put it that way. The, the whole region is a bit of an oil field in the literal but also in the more um, symbolic sense that it is easy to lit on fire. Um, and when we had the killing of Suleiman in January, I think everybody who worked on the region was holding their breath, um, being afraid of how, how quickly and how it is going to escalate. And then it went down actually rather smoothly, one has to say, compared to what we were afraid to see. Um, and that's a bit, bit the the situation, um, how I would describe it. So there is always this danger of a quickly blowing up escalation, but we have seen in the last 12 months, and I think the non-reaction to the killing that you just mentioned last week um, in Iran also shows that no one in the region seems to have an interest at the moment to get into an escalation that means a point of no return. And that is some hope. And that's why I think it's important that we discuss how Germany, but also how the EU can actually build on that willingness to not escalate. But of course, if we fail, there is continuing that danger of, of major escalations because we have seen in the past, and we should not forget that every decade, a major war in the region, it started with Iraq-Iran war in the 80s, the Iraq war in the 90s, then in 2003, we had the um, escalation with ISIS, and we have still ongoing the Yemen war where different actors in the region are, I mean, hooked into each other somehow on, on different sides, on the same sides. So the escalation potential is there, but there is also at the moment an opening to maybe walk down other avenues. Thank you. And, uh, Nils, Alan, how would you assess the, the current situation? in terms of escalation or not escalation or... Um, yeah, well, I, I, I agree uh, that we have a tense uh, situation with some of the events mentioned um, in your introduction, but also um, I can, can support what Hannah said. I mean, the next few weeks will be maybe uh, giving us a, a hint on whether or not, especially in Tehran, uh, the current government will be able to maintain uh, its uh, influence on the events and the control situation also within Iran, as you all know, has developed in a very concerning way. The economic situation is extremely difficult. 
uh, the hardliners within the regime are making gr ground uh, in, in their political infights. And well, nobody has a crystal ball, but I believe that everybody who is observing right now what is happening within Iran does not expect that the I'm almost a little hesitant to call them reformers, but the more pragmatic uh, part of the regime will be able to defend its position in the government. So uh, that struggle, that internal struggle is escalating at a time uh, where the outgoing Trump administration, uh, probably also um, with some forces in the Gulf, is trying um, to make things harder uh, for um, Joe Biden. And um, while I'm not here to speculate about uh, the assassination that you just saw uh, and, and, the, and the responsibilities, uh, but it is absolutely obvious um, that we need rational actors right now because there could be an opportunity, a real opportunity, not to go back to the old Obama years. Nobody is expecting that too much happened on almost every side in the region, but there will be an opportunity uh, with Joe Biden to come back to a negotiated path. And that's uh, where I believe our interest lies. And uh, we have to have that discussion also with our friends in the Gulf, whether or not the maximum pressure strategy really contributed to peace and stability in the region and whether or not it really contributed also to the security of our friends in the Gulf and especially to Israel. I have my doubts. Uh, and so, um, so we are in a very delicate, fragile situation. And, and um, I, I would never you know, um, pretend that the JCPOA was designed to solve all the problems in the region, but it had one single but very important purpose. And that remains uh, also the German goal in the region to make sure that whatever happens, Iran is not going to control and, and get a nuclear weapon. Uh, and we, we actually share that uh, goal also with the Trump administration. But I believe the, the, the truth is um, that the current strategy has not brought us closer uh, to our common goal. So we have to have that discussion and there's not that much time also because of the internal developments that uh, we are expecting to see uh, quite soon uh, in Iran. Since you mentioned already the, the crystal ball, um, I would like now to turn to you, uh, Dorothea, Dorothea and, and uh, Cornelius. Um, I know you don't have a crystal ball or maybe you don't, you have, but uh, most likely not. Um, but uh, I would like to pose you the question anyway, what steps and development will we most likely see um, in, in the future, in the near and midterm future, when it, uh, when it comes to escalation? So can you maybe say, okay, that are the most likely one, two, three steps, uh, how this uh, scenario theater might evolve in the next um, weeks or something? Maybe Dorothea, Dorothea you, you might go, go, go first. Okay, so first of all, thanks a lot for inviting me because I know you've been trying to to secure my presence in Lokum for like years and now at <laughs> least through Zoom, yeah, true. you managed. <laughs> so when I was um, trying to prepare this workshop and see uh, about the question about escalation, I was wondering what escalation you were alluding to actually. So now I understand better that you had in mind the basically the Iran-Arab relationship um, but I think we can uh, broaden uh, the perspective, of course. And first I'd say that, uh, anyway, escalation has already taken place everywhere in the MENA region. So conflicts do exist. And uh, um, fortunately, I think we've reached the de-escalation phase in some of the conflicts, uh, Syria, of course, Libya, hopefully, uh, Yemen, maybe even. Uh, I don't want to be too optimistic, but I mean, this is where we have existing conflicts that are uh, still really worrying. So uh, I suppose the, um, the existence, if the, the, the effective um, presence of this conflict does act as a dissuasion 
uh, for uh, regional powers. I mean, I don't think many of them would like to engage further in new conflicts. I don't think, uh, uh, I don't think they would do it as the sorcerer's apprentice that they have done uh, recently uh, so easily. Maybe for one exception, uh, Turkey. Turkey is clearly currently the number one aggressive power in its borders. Uh, that has um, um, completely actually uh, freaked out of the, uh, the frames that we're trying to put to contain the security situation in the region. So we'll come back to Turkey in a minute. Um, but how do you explain that we've reached such a, an emergency situation in the region? First, the, the environment was, of course, exceptionally inducive for escalation under the Trump administration. I don't want to blame the Americans for everything, but clearly there was a sort of relative anarchy regionally. Uh, the um, traditional alliances were shaking. There were no multilateral mechanism to uh, solve the issues. Uh, the Americans were out of the GCPOA, which was arguably the, the most impressive uh, result of multilateral diplomacy, long-term multilateral diplomacy in the region. So uh, clearly with the Biden administration, we have a hope uh, for a more um, uh, inclusive approach and uh, de-escalation uh, mechanism that might place, but we should not forget that they will always be uh, have to be in line with the interest of, uh, of America more strictly defined. I, I would not necessarily share the optimism of so many analysts uh, because I don't see EU interests aligning with the US interests necessarily in the region, at least on the three issues, refugees, uh, and energy supply, the Americans don't have the same problem, and uh, arguably uh, for uh, radical Islamism either. The impact of the radicalization of some community and terror attacks is clearly stronger in some European countries France, of course, Germany as well, it has a terrible impact on the domestic political process. So I don't think the Americans are in the same situation with regard at least to these three issues. That's very important. Then uh, if we want to do a little more fo forecast and see, look at the crystal ball, not only as an element of decoration, um, you have to look at the main fault lines that remain within the region. So you have very important fault lines between Arab Gulf states within the GCC itself. Uh, you know that we have the news that there was a reconciliation process that almost reached uh, success very recently between uh, Saudi Arabia and Qatar. I think the fault line is still very strong and the, um, the, the quarrel within the GCC has left a very durable trace uh, in the relations between the countries there. And this is exporting more instability, of course, out of the Gulf, uh, because they are fighting their proxy, proxy wars, uh, especially in Libya, apparently. Um, then with the outside, of course, Iran is a point but that's been discussed. Turkey is the most immediate difficulty for Arab Gulf states, such as Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and uh, the UAE. Clearly, uh, it's, it's been defined as the the number one forward uh, And one important front line seems to have disappeared with Israel, but has it really disappeared? I'm quite uh, pessimistic uh, regarding the, um, the way the, um, the current regimes will be able to sell a, the uh, reconciliation with Israel to their public opinion when in the same time, at the same time, Turkey, Iran, Qatar, to a certain extent, extent will play exactly in the opposite camp and will try to uh, still raise tensions around the Palestinian issue. And on the longer run, uh, I think economics do matter a lot. Uh, Post-COVID crisis, um, some countries who were in a very dire economic situation, especially in the Maghreb, uh, are suffering a lot. And uh, this, of course, but Iraq, of course, is also another, and Lebanon. So you have at least Algeria, Iraq, and Lebanon, three countries where you have pre revolutionary situations before COVID 19, before the suspension of international relations. 
um, so three places where you may have a replica of the Arab Spring or Arab uprising very easily. And then the last thing to watch are, of course, external interferences with China wanting to take a stake probably more into some economic sectors in the region and with the parallel standoff with the US. There is a sort of power competition, a new type of power competition that could materialize in the Middle East. And of course, the rising of Russia as a very important strategic actor in the region. It's been too long, sorry, but anyway. Okay, thank you very much. Now to you, uh, to your crystal ball, uh, Cornelius. What would you say? So the three, two, three steps that we will might see in the future, in the near-term future. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Thomas, um, and and thanks to the my previous uh, speakers, uh, colleagues on the panel. Um, there is not much that I feel I can say after uh, their, their interventions, but I will still try, and I, I will um, do so by. Just returning to your original point, uh, Thomas, commending you uh, for putting this uh, together, the, the, the conference, but also uh, a panel with this title. Uh, to be very honest, um, the Middle East, the region and turmoil is probably an eternal title um, for any event um, on uh, this particular region. Um, so uh, that it doesn't take much um, to, to be wrong there. It, it actually reminds me um, when I started uh, with the German Council on Foreign Relations um, some years back, uh, a colleague who had a screensaver, um, the days when you still had screensavers, uh, and uh, he had a slogan saying, there's always hope for more despair. Um, so with that uh, thinking, um, let me tell you what I see as the kind of trends um, and extrapolate them into the future to give you some, some idea. Um, the first one, obviously, uh, is the role of Iran, uh, which, which uh, some of you, uh, I believe, uh, Hanna and Niels have said that Iran is in control over the escalation. Um, my, my question, or my, my, my question mark, I would say, is uh, who in Iran is in control of the escalation? Um, because uh, not, no country, obviously, is, is unitary in that sense. Uh, but we need to be aware that uh, there, may, uh, there are some elements inside Iran that would actually have an interest in escalation. Um, and there are others, uh, the ones that uh, Western governments usually speak to, uh, who are not interested in escalation in this particular period uh, of time. So this is something um, that, that needs to be taken uh, into consideration. Um, it is likely, I would say, that up until um, the Iranian presidential election next year in June, um, this, uh, the Supreme Leader will somehow hold this together. Um, but there is a lot of factional uh, infighting going on inside Iran. Um, uh, people are, are jockeying for positions um, when it comes to the, the presidential election, the potential um, succession uh, of Khamenei. Um, and we had already seen a hardline shift um, in the parliamentary elections earlier this year, uh, and we, we will continue to see this. But for the moment, it seems that uh, the Iranian leadership is banking uh, on no further escalation um, until uh, the inauguration um, and then a bit of a grace period so that negotiations can actually start with an incoming Biden administration. And then we will see what happens around, um, around uh, their own presidential elections. I think one element uh, that we can see, as you mentioned, um, the assassination uh, last uh, week, uh, is that Iran, um, the leadership, seems to have responded in the nuclear field. I mean, this was a kinetic um, uh, escalation, uh, a killing of another uh, official slash scientist. Um, and it, uh, the parliament has reacted, uh, policymakers have come out, um, and they seem to uh, be wanting to escalate on the nuclear file, uh, ramping up uh, the enrichment um, and uh, possibly, um, uh, well, ev ev evicting uh, the inspectors uh, if sanctions relief is not forthcoming after January 20th. Um, so that's, that's a shift um, in a way, uh, they, they don't want to go for regional escalation, military escalation. Uh, but they are looking at, uh, at this. Uh, it's in fact the, uh, the course of action that Iran has pursued ever since uh, the United States uh, withdrew from uh, the nuclear deal, the JCPOA, um, where they both ramped up uh, the nuclear um, uh, file by, by uh, withdrawing, uh, well, uh, step by step, uh, taking down their, their, um, their measures uh, as regards the JCPOA but also um, through the, uh, the incidents uh, that we observed last summer of 2019 in the Persian Gulf uh, to make their neighbors afraid of what Iran can do either directly or through proxies. 
Um, so this is this is one element where we can at any moment see further escalation um, if and when uh, the the situation is not resolved around um, the uh, around the nuclear file. And um, this, uh, I, I think I can stop there because it gives us a bit of an idea um, uh, of what lies ahead. And I, I very much, of course, look forward uh, to, to further interventions also from colleagues. Okay. Thank you. So with that um, brief kick off round on recent events, I would like to go to more to the broader um, eternal question. <laughs> of this uh, panel and looking and um, trying to, to elaborate a bit on, on Europe's future role in, in more general terms in the in the region. I would like to first turn to you, Hannah Neumann. Um, and since Christmas is coming, um, I would mm -hmm. like to ask uh, for your wish list um, when it comes to um, Europe uh, policy towards the Gulf. And since I know that you are very um, very um, involved also in, in human rights affairs, and um, no, since you know the region as well, um, if I would like to ask um, you for your for your wish list, what would you do if you could uh, change Europe's policy towards the region? And I would like to ask you uh, if you could focus in particular on, on this um, very difficult relations between um, so civil society and uh, state structures in the region, um, since this is somehow a dilemma for Europe. On the one hand. We want, we have to, or we want to have relations with states um, in the region, which are often outspokenly authoritarian. And on the other hand, we want to have relations with the civil society. Um, that's uh, somehow a dilemma. So, what's your wish list to, for 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 Europe? Okay. Uh, well, I mean, the wish list is no less than global peace, but maybe we need to break it down a bit to to discuss in terms of policy. Um, and and let me say. Let me allow to say two things before I start speaking about the wish list, which I think is important to understand the policy options of the European Union. It has to be said, especially for the Arabian Peninsula countries, so the whole classical GCC Gulf states, for a long time they have not seen the European Union as an actor in foreign policy. So they were dealing with the Germans and they were dealing with the French and the Italian. And they were quite happy doing that until they found out that in three areas that are key to their policy, apparently the EU is in charge. That is visa liberalization, that is free trade agreements, and that is the whole financial market. So by the time we, the EU were blacklisting some of them, there was the whole disaster and all of a sudden they all had their embassies with the European Union and they are engaging with the European Parliament um, and also with the European Commission much more. And it's a bit this ambivalence with them saying, well, I mean, we need we still have these strong ties with France and Germany, but we see the European Union, first of all, as this important actor in these areas, but also as more neutral. And that's very interesting to see because French is perceived to be siding with Saudis, for example, and the Germans are said somehow to be closer to Iran and have this special relationship with Turkey. And somehow the European Union could have a more mediational role because in, in its totality, it's seen more neutral, which is, is a big um, achievement. And the second thing goes to something, Thomas, you said when you asked me to speak about civil society. I think for a long time, especially the geopolitical foreign policy people have thought of the region as some thing between Saudis and Iran. So, so basically, we're trying to explain everything with the relationship between Saudi and Iran and Israel making everything more complicated. But that falls short. And as long as we do that, I think we will fall short of providing feasible policy options. Based on that, now, wish list on three areas. I made a wish list on three areas. The first one, and I'm sure Niels will also say something about that, the escalation beyond reviving the Iran nuclear deal. So one thing is the Iran nuclear deal, but I leave that to the questions or for Niels, what to do about it. I think a second aspect is that we really need to discuss about arms exports in the region because the European Union countries are continuously supplying this region with weapons. And if you ever need to prove that weapons do not make a region more secure, look into that region. These countries just have too much money and they spend it on too much weapons and it doesn't make things easier at all. The European Union doesn't have a formal say in that, but if all EU member states would agree to stop the supply of weapons, it would really change something. Then, of course, working on Yemen, the escalation in Yemen. 
And and I find this very interesting um, with the Abraham's Accords that were were slightly um, I think touched by Cornelius and Dorothy. So the um, starting of having diplomatic relations between UAE, Bahrain, and Israel. There has also been a silent visit of Netanyahu to Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has never denounced, um, or I mean, they have never supported the Abraham's Accords, but they have also never said that they dislike it, which I think is a very strong sign. Um, and I think we really should do a reality check whether this is just for business and as an alliance against Iran, or whether they really want to do what they say in rhetoric, having this also as a way to de-escalate in the region and build peace. And that's why I would really like to see another push for an EU, um, an EU engagement in terms of um, working on Israel and Palestine, because I think there we would really see how constructive the engagement would then be of UAE and Saudi Arabia especially. Second aspect, move human rights. And here I would really like to see the EU, but also the governments in the region to work to move from human rights rhetoric to human rights action. Especially Saudi Arabia, but also Qatar, UAE, and all our special friends are very good now in human rights rhetoric. So I mean, all the amazing things that they have done, and some of them are true. I mean, I have been in Saudi in March, I didn't have to wear an abaya. They have women in parliament, some of them also showing their face, even these women on the headlines of newspapers with their pictures. That was unbelievable two or three years ago. So we see an opening there, but it's this attitude of, I open up because I grant these rights to the women, but don't the women dare to claim the rights. And that's a bit um, the, the ambiguity we have. And here I would really like to see the European Union being stronger on really holding them by their word. And we've seen a number of cases, Lujain Alhatlul has been in the news lately, but also Naskin so today, where human rights defenders have been meeting European diplomats, we have seen the same in Egypt lately, have been meeting European diplomats and that has been one of the major reasons why they went into jail. And I really think that's unacceptable. Because that makes it impossible to deal with civil society and in Saudi Arabia and in some of the other um, GCC countries we have a situation where basically we don't have a proper civil society inside the country anymore and where discussions that should happen inside the country are happening, for example, in Brussels, because that is the only area where they are still able to, to speak up. So more human rights dialogues, more also symbolic action following up on these cases. And we soon have by Monday, congratulations to the German Council presidency, the human rights sanctions mechanism, which allows the European Union to have sanctions against individuals. So you don't have any longer to put like a whole geographical area or country under a sanctions mechanism to then target individuals, but you can directly target individuals for great human rights abuses. And I wouldn't be surprised if we would have some um, friends from these um, regions under the mechanism by the end of next year. The other aspect, and it, I think that's especially true for Iraq, and I just came back from Iraq about a month ago, is how do we deal with civil society in the country? So we have civil society, where we have some kind of democracy, but where the system, the way it works, does not um, provide a role in the political sphere for these, especially young people, but civil society organizations. And here there has been a very, very strong wish, and I really think the European Union has to live up to it, for election observation next year in Iraq so that people feel more secure when they go, but also before the election to do awareness raising. So in the end, that may be more than 25% of the people would actually um, register for the elections and go there. So where, where we see small signs of democracy, although it's not wonderful and easy and it will always be violent, just support them as much as we can. And I know this will be tricky. We will have to see how the US continues with Biden and Iraq. That's the whole topic of itself but we should not give up on the idea to do that. Third point, constructive cooperation on global challenges, and I especially mean climate change when I talk about the goal. The European Union can be climate neutral by 2035 or 2050. It doesn't matter if others don't join because we are in charge of 10% of the global CO2 emissions. So the only way 
we can save this planet is by cooperating with others, especially those that have the fossils underground, because we need to find ways for them to keep them underground. And at the moment, these regimes finance their regime and their whole patronage system with oil money, and they base their geopolitical power on oil and oil money. So they will not just because they are super nice, not do it anymore, but they recognize that they need to change somehow. So we will need to engage with them constructively to find ways how they can somehow keep this geopolitical power and also this source of revenue, but by other means. And I mean, to, to make it very simple, let's talk about solar panels, not fighter jets. And I think that's a way that we should pursue with much more energy also because if you want to be climate neutral, it's a dependency. If you want to be climate neutral in the EU, we will need to have some clean energy supply from elsewhere, I'm pretty sure. And that could be a way to do it. And for me that, I mean, that doesn't do away with the human rights problems, but it would still be a much more constructive engagement than sending weapons to each other. And yeah, let's leave it there. And I want to hear what Neil is saying. Yeah. Uh -huh. Mr. Arnen, what, what is your, your wish list for, for Europe's policy towards the Gulf or German policy towards the Gulf since you are in that function? Yeah, well, I, I, I haven't actually prepared a wish list, um, um, but, uh, but I believe what has become abundantly clear is that we cannot rely on other actors um, to stabilize the region, which is essentially our neighborhood. Uh, maybe sounds strange for people in, in my district in Hamburg, but I consider this to be our European neighborhood. Um, so we, we could see the immediate effects of uh, a smaller US footprint in the region in some parts. Um, we saw uh, very clearly in the regional wars and conflict, especially in Syria, but also in Libya, that we have regional actors like Turkey stepping in. So there's no vacuum in politics that will be filled by other actors. And um, so some aspect of, uh, of the German policy and our, our activities over the last weeks and months also within the frame um, of our rotating presidency right now has been, if I pick the example of, of Libya, first try to bring the major European actors together. Germany has not been a traditional, you know, um, interest broker in Libya, but I believe everybody knows about which countries I'm talking about and to try to initiate a process that offers a political opportunity for the Libyans themselves, but also to keep the outside actors um, from continuing to, to turn that country into another battlefield, which partially it already is. Um, if we don't succeed, I believe uh, we must be prepared to see a Syria-like scenario where it's not the European Union, but in that case, it's basically Russia and Turkey and to a part also Iran deciding about a country and its future and its people uh, that is a part of our broader European neighborhood and that it affects us, uh, our politics, our security uh, is very obvious to German citizens because um, we saw how many refugees came to Europe and Germany not only provided most of the humanitarian aid in the region, but also welcomed most of the refugees in the entire European Union. Uh, so my, my impression is it's very difficult because we have to do both, try to bring the Europeans together uh, while at the same time doing crisis management in the region. And also because the United States withdraw not from all, but from many aspects of humanitarian aid and assistance, uh, we also had to financially try to fill the void. So um, when I'm reading that Europe is absent as an actor, well, 
I'm not sure which criteria um, is being used to come to that conclusion. We are maybe not sufficiently present in terms of military power projection, although with Operation Irini, we are trying to make under extremely difficult circumstances also um, a contribution. But, but um, if you look at what Europe has been trying to do, um, it, it, is, um, it is a lot. So um, I believe uh, we cannot wait for the Biden administration you know, to completely change dynamics in the region. I agree with uh, what, what Dorothy Schmidt said, but I believe that there is a, a great many of opportunities with another attitude. Whether we will be able to use that opportunity depends entirely on us and, and the ability of Europeans uh, to come together in, in that. Um, and so, so many uh, aspects of the scenario and, and conflicts has been mentioned that I am a bit cautious now to, to turn to each and every country, um, but I agree. I mean, the Abraham Accords, we welcomed them not only in statements, but um, Minister Maas invited Minister uh, Ashkenazi and his Emirati counterpart to Berlin. They had intense uh, debates and discussion and also a public messaging, I believe, which was powerful together with the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin. So that is a good um, and maybe even historic opportunity. And I observe um, almost a kind of enthusiasm uh, on the Israeli side. Uh, people in, in, in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem believing that this could in contrast to the rather tactical and cold peace with Egypt and Jordan offer real opportunities also in terms of people to people contact the cultural aspect, but especially in the economic field. Um, and that's maybe true. And we should try our utmost to make that possible. But that, that um, enthusiasm that, I, that I, I, I felt there also during uh, visits in the region is somehow overshadowing the very simple fact that the Abraham Accords may be a historic achievement, but they are not yet a contribution to solving the conflict with the Palestinians. Um, so now we are maybe going to another election in Israel, nobody knows. Um, prospect that a new possible, possibly new government will be even more to the right than the current government, uh, are very realistic. And um, my impression is without an idea, an initiative, and also certain pressure, we will not see much progress because, um, um, you know, the, the Gulf countries, they are focusing on the benefit that they could get from the Abraham Accords. And that's fine with me, but they don't have, I don't think I'm doing uh, any injustice here. Uh, they don't have an agenda that really includes a contribution to solving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And from the Palestinian side, not to talk with them um, emotionally after they have, you know, they felt left uh, outside and out there in the cold, I understand that, but that's not a policy. So I don't see anybody other than the Europeans to try to bring together an initiative and to make sure that what, in a very um, brave step, Gabi Ashkenazi said publicly that with the Abraham Accords annexation and with annexation, then also the so-called Trump plan is off the table, uh, that we should try to make sure that that is really what is happening. And that's why the European Union also uh, made a strong statement and the German government, uh, when we saw that their new major um, decisions in the pipelines for new settlements, including in Jerusalem. Demolitions in the uh, occupied territories are ongoing uh, under conditions of a pandemic. Uh, so you see, um, I could go on um, with my <laughs> wish list, uh, but as I said in the beginning, uh, if Europeans believe that um, we can afford not to engage in the region, we will see as we saw in a dramatic way uh, with Syria, 
that uh, this is not an option, not only because we feel as Europeans a responsibility also to what Hannah said about human rights and the humanitarian situation, but it's also quite, um, quite obvious that this is affecting our own security, prosperity and stability. Thank you very much. Um, I would like now to turn to you, Dorothy. Um, well, we have now here the, the perspective from Brussels and from, from Berlin. And I would like to ask you for a French perspective. So how would, um, um, since you observe the debate um, on golf policy in Paris very closely, what would be so the friend, French arguments or ideas when it comes to, well, uh, more active engagement with, with the region? What's, what's your, what, what would you answer on that? Thank you, Thomas. This is always very um, embarrassing when, you know, our French friends um, sort of embark us on the reflection of what does the EU have to do with the region, because the French have this very uh, paradoxical way to look at the EU's capacities. Um, Macron is extremely pro-EU, he's very pro-European, he wants to move forward, but he's going alone most of the time. So, uh, and I think this is even more um, uh, obvious to him that he has to move alone uh, currently because he feels with the Brexit, the United Kingdom is basically out of the game and he sees the Germans coming in, um, but we don't know what the Germans will be willing and capable to do in the region. So for the time being, uh, I don't think, I think we trust, I mean, uh, we, I mean, Macron or the French administration tr trust only themselves to deal with the region. And this is becoming a problem because they're uh, becoming more isolated in their uh, strategic outlook. Uh, they are sort of a lockdown into this, their mindset um, uh, filled with vested interest. And I'm, I'm just out of a workshop uh, with, people from the American administration. And I keep hearing a lot of French bashing, especially um, regarding France's role in Libya. And I, I, I don't think the uh, French administration is uh, completely aware of how much bashing there is and how uh, nobody's understanding uh, how they, they're perceived to, uh, to be spoiling uh, the efforts of everyone to come for an inclusive solution in Libya. So uh, they think uh, that the UK is not a, uh, there anymore. The Germans, we don't know what they want. The Italy and Spain can play the spoilers. We've been at odds with Italians, especially over Libya <laughs> and partly over the um, Eastern Med issue recently. Uh, and then we've been trying to woo Greece and Cyprus into our community and to turn them into faithful supporters. I mean, this is a, I'm just doing a sort of a caricature of uh, how the French are renationalizing their outlook on the, on the Middle East, on the Mediterranean and the Middle East, you know. Uh, this being said, uh, I think Macron's principle is that Europe has to come together. Uh, but they probably have to come together until, um, under Franco-German leadership. And then there is this issue of the growing divergences between the French and the Germans on several issues in the, in the region. And uh, um, as we had to, had to observe closely what happened with the East Med crisis this summer, uh, and we have lots of Franco-German partnerships going on with IFRI, it was extremely, really striking to me to see that Actually, we shared the diagnosis, but we deferred on the solutions and on the way to address what was perceived as Turkey's uh, extreme uh, aggressiveness. Um, so uh, during the whole summer, there was a lot of worries expressed on the side of the German presidency of the EU and the French were just heading on, you know, to, on the, in Libya and also in Lebanon, right after the explosion of the Beirut port. You know that Macron traveled to Beirut twice this summer, and then he went to Iraq, and then he was extremely uh, uh, firm and, uh, on, the, on the East Med. Uh, and we saw um, German worries rising uh, in parallel. And then in the end, there was this moment when Erdogan decided to withdraw 
one of the ships that he resends, he keeps on sending, you know, every two weeks. But at some point, there's a sort of de-escalation movement. And then we hear on the German side, okay, this fantastic division of labor, bad cop, good cop, work perfectly. Like, you know, the French threaten and we mediate. And in the end, we're glad that the French threatened the Turks because it's what uh, actually dissuaded the Erdogan, etc. I don't think this works if you systematically ex post agree on what had to be done. Whereas you, dis you disagree ex ante and during the crisis, you basically quarrel. I think this is not going to work on the long run. Uh, it's not, it's completely useless to you know, reconcile after the crisis and say that that's wonderful. This is exactly what we wanted because we've been very close to a sort of divorce, you know, on this Eastern Med crisis this summer. So I definitely think we need more Franco-German communication, discussion, and um, in fact, mutual respect to a certain point, because I see that we tend to under underestimate uh, the Germans' um, seriousness involvement on these issues that we've seen on Libya, for instance. We just now, everybody's counting on the Germans, uh, you know, to have everyone come together and find a solution. And then uh, we act on the margins as free riders. Okay, so I think the Germans deserve more respect. You know? Also because they have uh, very decent teams, they have resources, etc. maybe we don't have for the time being. Uh, but I think the French should also be um, respected in the, their capacity to think the region historically. The only thing is that you have to push them to be a little more progressive because now they have this sort of superstition that history is repeating in the Middle East, you know? So every time we need to have a, uh, a landmark to take a frame to think about the future of the region, it's like we're regressing. Okay, how was it prior to the First World War? How was it uh, during Cold War? How was it 10 years ago? Uh, how is it before the Trump administration? Started? No, we have to be a little more imaginative, you know, creative, and we have to move forward. And uh, I think the French are only, only starting to acknowledge all the, uh, the, the great uh, earthquake that the Arab Spring was, because we totally missed it. We missed the changing of the societies in the Middle East, which is probably with economics, to me, the most interesting, but interesting parameters that we have to follow. Do not concentrate all the time on military issues. See what's brewing inside Arab societies, including in Gulf countries, Arab Gulf countries. Um, and also look at economics, because as I mentioned earlier, uh, the dire conditions in some countries will lead to more uprisings and more difficulties, and I think, Algeria is definitely becoming a black hole in that regard. So uh, we want uh, more discussion. I, I want more discussion with the Germans, more agreements with the Germans, because I think we have to move together. Otherwise we will neutralize each other, which is which has, we see constantly on the Turkey file, I think. Um, I think we can, bring and we're ready to work on a more consistent uh, humanitarian and reconstruction perspective from the EU. Uh, because after the wars, uh, after the uh, peace agreements, uh, reconstruction will be the big task of the international community uh, in Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen, in Libya. And if we maybe we're not this time going to be the, the bankers necessarily. We have a lot of experience in bringing donors together and designing reconstruction uh, plans. And I think this, this technical uh, knowledge and this capacity to mediate between different type of actors, civil society, international institutions, states is very important. I think the EU can do that properly. Uh, then there is a question about, I think, um, I think the French would like to see uh, European economics uh, become more politicized. I think we're, for, we're in for sanctions and there I have my doubts. I'm not sure sanctions are very efficient. We've discussed that intensively in a workshop about the ISMED recently, where uh, basically I agreed with the Greeks that with Turkey, threatening san of sanctions is more efficient than implementing sanctions. 
you have to look big but once they realize you're not doing what you said you would do it doesn't work and once they realize they can shun things it doesn't work um so i'm not sure we should systematically politicize the economic leverage that we have uh, we had also that discussion in the, the big work we did with the svp on the customs union the upgrading of the customs union with turkey uh, it's been a very frustrating discussion because for we, an entire year we discussed about the customs union and then in the end the french said we have to cancel the customs union okay formidable so we just issue a wonderful paper saying uh, giving all sorts of uh, you know directions etc um, but rereading the common paper that we did i realized that the germans said they wanted to insert uh, human rights conditions inside the text of the uh, upgraded uh, modernized uh, uh, customs union uh, agreements and i don't think it's working anyway because this is a very technical commercial issue and it's not like um showing uh, uh, and being extremely precise and directive into mixing the commercial issues with this that I don't think is going to work. Okay, so maybe that's my personal position, but I think this is something I would like to discuss further actually with my German counterparts. And last thing that's very important, the French Macron especially want Europe to show more muscles. They want to go for strategic autonomy. That's very clear. They want to go for European defense. And we see there uh, that there is a sort of, a, there is a tactical alliance that could work with the German right there. But we see also so many discussion within the uh, German polity, between the left, the right, the extreme right, the extreme left, the middle, if there is any, uh, that uh, we don't know what the result of the whole debate will be. But clearly the French think that they have been the one active militarily in the region. They have been uh, endorsing responsibilities. They've been acting uh, with the, side by side with the Americans, sometimes the British, etc. And we have to share this with some other member states of the EU. And this has definitely to be discussed uh, and beyond with the partnership with the Germans. This has to be discussed clearly with Spain and Italy at least. So we'll stop that. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much now to you, Cornelius. Uh, you, you, you were here listening all, all the time quietly. Um, and before we, um, before we move to the debating part and to bringing the virtual um, participants in who, of course, I just wanted to remind you participants out there, you can write us questions, comments through the chat. Before we do this, um, I would last uh, uh, like to ask you if um, if you have some questions, views, argument in mind, which we didn't touch upon during our, our discussion here. Is there something we should um, should bring in some some points or some some arguments? Um, so, of Deutsch in, in German, it would be the Ausputzer who brings everything in in the end. But um, so, what what what's what's what have you missed in the debate so far? Thank you, um, and, and thanks for the, the wish list question, which uh, is great because it not only brings out a lot of ideas, and I think um, colleagues on the panel have already painted um, a very good picture of, of what is needed in the region. Um, it also, your question also reminds me um, that I have to come up um, with a better answer to my son, my nine-year-old son, who keeps asking what would I want for Christmas, uh, and I haven't come beyond uh, health and happiness for my family, and he wants something more tangible. Um, so I'll, I'll keep thinking about that. Um, more seriously, the, there is uh, also an expression about Christmas tree legislation in the United States, uh, where there is one piece of legislation and everyone can hang their ornaments, uh, their, their wish, uh, wish list ornaments uh, onto the Christmas tree. Um, and that brings me to the, the really crucial question of the United States, the current transition uh, going on there, um, and uh, the Iran file. Um, Hannah was kind enough to point me to this. Um, so, um, because time is short, just one thing that I would wish is for the Europeans to have the courage to bring this forward over the next weeks and months, um, together with the United States, uh, to come to uh, whatever um, compliance for compliance deal in the spring um, before the Iranian elections, um, and then to make a, an even bolder step uh, in the fall of, of next year, 
um, to try and negotiate um, a broader agreement, um, which everyone has on their minds. And, uh, you know, many of the things that we have discussed here would fall into this. Um, why am I, am I focusing on, on this in particular? Well, it's my field of expertise, so forgive me for that, but it also uh, it necessitates a lot of uh, the other uh, elements that have been mentioned. So this broader split, the, the shifting of power inside uh, the region uh, around the Persian Gulf, this Arab realignment with Israel, um, which we have seen over the Qatar crisis, over the Abraham Accords, this, which is basically an entrenchment vis-a-vis -vis Iran, um, uh, and which, which hails back to the days of when the JCPOA was negotiated, where all these powers, the regional powers, were adamantly against any kind of concessions, any kind of compromise. Uh, with Iran. And so it will be difficult uh, to come back to um, the JCPOA, um, but it's, it's crucially important uh, because without, um, uh, you know, reenacting the deal um, in some shape or form, I'm not saying 100%, but something which needs to be put back in place, without this, any of the other ideas um, that, that we have uh, surrounding uh, the Persian Gulf, um, a wider agreement between uh, the Arab countries and Iran, um, a peace in, in the conflicts that were mentioned, uh, where both Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia and other countries do play a critical role. Um, this will, is not going to come to pass because many of these conflicts um, they have been boiling or they have been stoked, I would say. Boiling is too passive. They have been stoked precisely uh, because um, uh, countries, actors in the region have used it uh, to their own advantage. Um, and uh, here, um, just looking back, the European Union prides itself of the, uh, the nuclear agreement of 2015, rightly so, um, but it's been, uh, it's been haphazard negotiations over this decade before, more than often, uh, the European Union was, was lucky to, to somehow um, make, be able to make the ne next step. Um, it is commended, uh, it is to be commended uh, for the, the steadfastness with which the Europeans have held up the deal over the past two, two and a half, uh, three years, or actually ever since um, the US, the current US president came into office. But they should not lose this on, on the last uh, mile, so to say. Um, it, it really takes an effort now uh, reaching out to an administration which cannot officially, an incoming administration, which cannot officially talk to policymakers here. So one has to use uh, back channels in order to clear the ground, um, uh, be upright also with Iran about what is feasible um, and, and what it, it ought to uh, expect uh, in these upcoming negotiations. And then really um, let the US administration hit the ground running on January 20th um, and make sure that uh, there is uh, this, this agreement um, by the spring, uh, because then it's again election time in Iran and who, who else knows what will happen in the region. Um, uh, so that's, that's my, my plea in a way. Um, and uh, as I say, other things can be taken from that, but this is really urgent. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and I would now, now shift to the, the discussion part. I ask participants out there right question if, the, if you want to. Otherwise, I would ask you if you have something to pick on from the other panelists. Um, Hannah Norman, I see you, you, you're ready somehow. Please, then, if you want to raise a point, please. I have the feeling that you, you want me. Oh. Yeah, well, I mean, I got stuck over the notion of strategic autonomy that Dorothy introduced in the discussion. And you will now see a prime example of the problem between France and Germany that, and I think there Dorothy is very right, also plays out in the Gulf, um, but maybe especially in Libya. Because in the European Parliament, of course, we are having exactly these discussions between people from different political groups, but especially when it comes to foreign security policy, it's very interesting to see that fault lines are more often along national borders than along party politic lines and this whole debate about strategic autonomy is clearly one in that direction and um, I have to say I am a bit enervé by this debate um, because for the way strategic autonomy is put forward by Macron and is put forward by his fellows in the European Parliament and is lived for example in the case of Libya is we want European strategic autonomy as long as Europe does what the French want. And if uh, this Europe uh, has wants to have strategic autonomy with not exactly what the French want, want, then the French go their way. 
and this is not European. And I think that the, the moment it came the most clear out and the most clearest one was when we had this debate about the nuclears, where basically Macron gave a speech, now I'm a bit over exaggerating, which said, you can all participate in our nuclear protection, so you can pay for it, but it's the French who decide when we push the button. And that is exactly not European. And as long as the there is this growing impression that basically French strategic autonomy only means can the others please pay or contribute in terms of human resources to French foreign policy um, priorities, we are not going to move anywhere. And I really hope that we will find a way to break up this pattern of frustration that is piling up and that blocks European policy and also blocks French policy and blocks German policy and the whole region. Would you, would you like to react to this? Oh, I think Hannah is not necessarily exaggerating. I see. <laughs> this is exactly what I was trying to say that uh, the French conceive uh, more European involvement only under French leadership. And the problem is that uh, I, I'm not sure they realize how how far their strategic outlook can differ from some of other EU member states. I mean, it would not pose a problem if everybody agreed on what the French want, but it's not necessarily the case. So, and there is also, Anna also pointed to, to the, um, the problem of resources. Clearly, uh, we want to keep our French strategic autonomy. That's, this, that's, you know, that's the ambivalence with the strategic autonomy, clearly. And further than that, uh, up to a certain point, there's also competition on markets with the with German uh, um, industrial firms and um, uh, arm producers. Uh, so uh, the debate is not entirely honest, I think. Um, but it has to be pursued because I think it's a very serious issue because I was also uh, very impressed to see that uh, after the election of Biden, most of the uh, reactions I could see in the European press was, uh, okay, don't rush to optimism because we maybe will have to uh, live in a world without Washington. We have to get used to not getting the support we need from the US. Uh, and we know we have some very urgent problems to to address uh, and we are very much on the defensive on our borders and um, and we need to, to reverse that attitude. I don't mean we need to be aggressive, but we need to be self-assured. We need to, to trust the EU. Um, so I think the debate on the strategic autonomy is probably, this is why actually it was my ending point. It's more the, the more important, the most important one because we're there at the, um, uh, that's a watershed moment. That's really a, that's really a moment bascule. That's a moment where we have to to move in one direction or another. And I'm absolutely appalled to see how isolated uh, the French are without even realizing it. But I think that's also a COVID nineteen effect, if you allow me. Like we've we've had a year where everyone was, you know going back to their own small business and uh, there was a lot of compartmentalization and i think people went uh, obsessed with some issues and strangely enough this summer macron who was really blamed internally for not being able to handle the health situation uh, surged you know on the diplomatic front and started to accumulate you know the super initiatives etc and he was also not really understood by the French themselves. Uh, but I think he needed this to recover from all the frustration he had internally. Uh, and all the countries are witnessing that type of situation. When we discussed the East Med the other day, what was very, again, uh, obvious was that uh, the Greeks said, we don't want to go to, to be too harsh on the Turks, but still we need a victory internally. Uh, the Turks uh, play that as if they had won the war against Armenia and Azerbaijan, because it's very important for Erdogan, you know, to get more support internally. Uh, Macron goes to Lebanon, and then the titles in the French press is a, a Lebanon is no foreign to France. I mean, the, we have this natural place because Macron needs this internally again. So you see, 
I'm, I'm really looking forward to the moment when we'll go to a normal social discussion uh, between ourselves also, because the crisis of multilateralism plus the COVID effect of isolation is really completely um, degrading our capacity to understand true problems. Do you want to, to raise a point? Or I just had a feeling that, that you, you raised your hand now, that's a, then a mistake. I'm just yeah. asking to the, to the round, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, um, it's a fascinating debate. Um, and um, Hannah, it's maybe the most critical attitude towards French foreign policy I heard from Greens for a long time because I used to listen to my friends in the in the Green Group and the Bundestag, they sometimes tend to have a different attitude. But look, I believe um, somehow we all, although I'm a social democrat and not a Christian democrat, but somehow I believe we all learned the lesson from Helmut Kohl, so that you have to salute the um, French flag twice, and. We all know how important that relationship is not only on a bilateral basis, but also for the future prospects of uh, having an integrated Europe and a more united foreign policy. So I'm, I'm a little hesitant to comment on, on every, every aspect that has been discussed, but I want to say that, um, that I'm not quite sure of the interpretation concerning the um, Eastern Mediterranean, you know, this playing good cop, bad cop um, view is really what was discussed in Berlin, at least not that much in our government. Um, uh, and it, it remains to be a very difficult situation. And although we had a beautiful signing ceremony for the Aachen Treaty, um, not everything that we agreed upon there, you know, the close coordination of foreign policy is always what is happening. So don't be surprised if some of the also military decisions, let's say, sent a frigate from one place to another, um, where decisions were also some in Berlin learned uh, about from the newspapers or from Twitter. Uh, so there, there is the potential to work even closer together, but I, I also, I, I'm not so sure if it's that dramatic, because at the end of the day, we have been able um, to make progress on Libya. At the end of the day, we are working together uh, to an astonishing extent for German standards in the Sahel region. Um, and and we, we have also learned that um, domestic politics in France matters to us. You know, it's not the German government's um, job to um, pick a favorite or to have um, partisan um, sympathies or priorities, but we, 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 we look at the map, the political map in France and I believe we need to learn in a united Europe to understand that there is also domestic pressure. Uh, we expect that from our French friends to understand that our system doesn't work like your system, so that a chancellor has another role in foreign policy and especially in military politics than a French president. Um, and somehow that has always been the case. So I, I was a bit puzzled to see that that debate between François, um, Emmanuel Macron and, and RKK about um, their respective speeches or articles. Is there any news in that, that uh, the French tradition has, I'm not sure if talk, calling it more goalist, but in a way um, putting a, a higher priority on, on national or strategic sovereignty. And that even dating back to the years of Adenauer, there was always a certain suspicion that the West Germans at those days <laughs> may be a little more too close uh, in their strategic thinking towards the United States. That is, that's not new. Important is that, um, that we come to conclusions. I personally doubt that there is anything like 
French strategic autonomy. Um, because why are we, I mean, there's good reason to be in the, in the Sahel, um, but we are not the only ones. And it will be, it's an overlooked question whether or not the American uh, military will stay in the region as an enabler. Um, that didn't, didn't really made it to the German news, but it will be crucial also for the future of Operation Barkhane and, and others. So uh, we should be honest about our own shortfalls in terms of military capacities. Um, and we should work together on European sovereignty, uh, but we will make sure that um, we are not only focusing on that aspect, but that we also um, use the opportunity that comes with the new Biden administration. And I'm among the optimists. I mean, we are different countries. We know that they have a, a 70 million votes for, for Donald Trump. So Biden and his team will not have the time entirely um, to dedicate themselves to European or Mediterranean politics. But it, the entire attitude is different. And we will have a reliable team of people grown up politically in working with allies. So um, I, I think that really offers us an opportunity and we should not, not blow it. Maybe in order to come to a round, if there are to an end, if there are no, oh, yeah, Cornelius, please. No, no, please. No, no. I would just use the opportunity uh, to come in. Um, uh, I, um, I don't want to, you know, uh, continue the, the Franco-German discussion so much, uh, even though it's, it's crucial in, in everything that Europe can do. Um, but it is my take uh, that uh, Emmanuel Macron, when he, he said what he said, he wasn't aiming for AKK, why, why should a French president uh, speak to uh, the minister of another country? Um, but- uh, We have to would... explain AKK is the, no, the exactly. abbreviation of the, the defense ministry. Uh, Min Minister. Anna Kahn is yeah. her full name, uh, and yes, I can say it. Um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, she's the defense minister. Um, so he was aiming uh, at her boss, um, but he was he was uh, basically uh, the defense minister was the straw woman in this case uh, of the chancellor, who who uh, I believe held, holds uh, similar positions. Um, but that's just why this uh, my my take on why this came up. Um, I wanted to um, to pick on uh, a point that Dorothee made about multilateralism, um, and uh, just because it strikes me, I mean, uh, you mentioned it, but we haven't actually looked at the region through a multilateral list lens. I would say, has anyone mentioned the United Nations at any point uh, in things that ought to be done? Why is that so? Because that region it's so close to Europe. It's a former uh, colonial um, region or the former colonies of, of European powers. Um, it's where the United States ran the show for decades. Um, it's, it's simply assumed that this is a region for great power play. Um, and this is how it's being discussed. Um, and the European Union uh, in its better days is trying to, to promote a different approach. Um, but because it has to uh, rely on member states providing uh, material ideas, strategies, what have you, um, it, it risks uh, falling back into, into this mode of uh, thinking along uh, national or, or this, this geopolitical lines. Um, and so uh, I take this, uh, you know, rather also as, a, uh, as an encouragement for myself to, you know, not follow those um, those lines of the past so much, but maybe think about, um, try to, to take a multilateralist look, even though it, it doesn't look very promising at the moment. Um, uh, you know, big member states uh, of the United Nations will make sure that the United, Station, uh, United Nations doesn't get a say. Uh, there's been a resolution uh, by the UN Security Council on regional security um, passed and uh, packaged uh, lying on the desk um, since 1988, uh, since the end of the Iran-Iraq war, uh, the United Nations Secretary General is tasked uh, in, in a quasi-permanent way to come up with a regional security setting. And there have been initiatives uh, to put this into practice, but none has succeeded. Um, so that may be something um, that, that is, uh, is, is ripe um, as part of this 
this bigger deal um, and uh, uh, another lens uh, through which man, one can look at uh, the region also uh, would be feminist foreign policy. Hannah was instrumental in pushing this uh, through in the European Parliament. Um, I happen to just have published a paper on what this would mean for Iran uh, concretely. And regardless of the fact whether you can implement this uh, the next day, probably you can't, and I'm the first to admit, um, it really um, it really is beneficial in the in the way how to to rethink uh, conflicts um, from um, and and to take a different look and not just um, you know follow on those status lines of a big power competition or uh, sectarian strife um, uh, the, the the economy has been mentioned a couple of times um, and and that's one key I believe um, uh, that that uh, is undergirding these conflicts, including why proxy groups are so powerful and and why they keep fighting when when they're you know rational uh, the or not rational theory rationalism tells you that there is no more uh, to fight for, um, but there are economic incentives. So um, this is something where um, scholars uh, certainly, but maybe also policymakers would do well in in, in adjusting their thinking. Um, it's uh, it's about time. A good concluding word it's about time <laughs> we are coming slowly to, to an end reaching the, the 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 time where we have to close actually um, i thank all of you and to the, the participants who are still with us um, for that round uh, i personally learned a lot um, and uh, with that i will say good good night and uh, maybe next year in in fall um, we can meet somewhere maybe in Lokom or elsewhere in person again and be get rid of all these um, digital things we are by now very tired of i guess so thank you very thank much you. yeah thank you. thanks for having us yeah, bonsoir, and I a lot, right? so, yeah. bonsoir. keep up bye. the spirit thank you very bye. much bye bye <laughs>